Anyway, I had a meeting with Will Rucker uh, last Friday, and we were just talking about, um, and we were talking about missional communities, organic communities, and you know how GCI is, uh, in, in a way, focusing on fellowship groups and small groups, and uh, we've been doing open hearts communities here for uh, a year now. That bad, that, that, it's been that long, huh? A year now. And, and so um, we were talking about open hearts communities and, and organic communities and fellowship groups and missional communities. And he asked me a question. He says, what's the foundational uh, doctrine about missional communities? And I had to think about that. And I kept thinking, but at that time, that's following <laughs> down to Jesus. <laughs> at that time, well, I leave it like that again. Anyway, uh, at that time I said, you know what, um, from my experience, as soon as we draw, as soon as we determine what separates us from the rest, and as soon as we draw our, our distinctives, we immediately draw a line between us and them. And this morning uh, I, I took a walk again, as I normally would on Sunday. And I had my prayer walk. And the one thing that really grabbed my heart and my mind this morning was those lines become fences. And those fences eventually become walls, which keeps them from coming in and us from going out. And eventually we end up being the prisoners of all our own making. Which reminds me of a uh, incident I had way back, back in the 80s. I was, I was outside my home and I told this story before. I was praying and we had this um, lovebirds in a cage. You know, lovebirds aren't supposed to be flying around, right? We put them in a cage and enjoy uh, their songs and the beauty of their color and you know how they, they kind of love one another inside that cage. Um, and I was praying to them at that time. And then I realized we had forgotten to buy bird feed for these lovers. And it was the third day that we had forgotten to buy bird feed for the lovers. I said, oh my God, these birds are going to die. And the first thought that comes to my mind after that was, no, they're not. That's going to be them. Right? From Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And the next thought that comes was, how can I you put them in a cage? See, all the birds out there, they feed, you know, you can go to Sunset Park or to Lloyd Land and all the other parts here. And you can see all those birds. And they're free to roam, right? And you know, they can find feed on the ground, but if you put them in a cage, they won't, right, until you give them the feed. No one wants to be in a cage, that's right. And that's why we have hundreds of thousands of people fleeing from Iraq and, and Syria. Now, let me change a little bit of the topic. This, that, that was a, sort of an introduction to the message today. I, I wear a cross. It's a gold cross. I inherited this from my father. When he died, he left this, and I was the most religious in my family. So they think. I took this, and I think my wife, you bought the uh, necklace, right? I think you bought the necklace. I put them together. I, I kept, I've worn this 24-7, right? go swimming, I go wherever I go, I have it on. And for me, it's a reminder of what Christ did for me. But really, it's more of a, uh, an insurance for me that if I ever go astray, I look at this and say, oh, you forgot. You know, Christ bought you. You need to come back. I wouldn't be nice if all of us had in one way or another, have a sign that says, hey, 
I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be nice? That we could just walk around and have a sign. So if you wear a cross, you probably are very proud of that cross because, you know, it tells everyone, I'm a Christian. Or if you have a cross with a, a Christ on it, a um, Catholic. Um, or, you know, all, any kind of thing that will tell everyone else. That's why people put bumper stickers on the back of their cars, right? Um, like a fish symbol. My brother-in-law has a fish symbol on the back of his rear bumper uh, in the Philippines. And some people put a cross. Some people uh, uh, buy special plates that says they're Christians. Wouldn't it be nice to have a sign that says, your disciple of Jesus Christ. And we approach John chapter 13, and it's funny how in the midst of the betrayal, yeah, wouldn't it be nice to have a badge like that? Right? Yeah? But really, that's not the sign that Jesus gives to us in John chapter 13. Now, the sign that he gives to us is if you try to study John chapter 13, it's in the midst of this. Next slide. It's in the midst of betrayal. They're having this meal, and then Jesus says to the person who was um, asking him, who was going to betray you? He says to the person um, that I give this piece of bread, he's going to be the one. And they actually didn't catch or understand what he was saying. So in the midst of this betrayal, he walks out and eventually um, these guards along with Judas, they come. He gives them a kiss. And that's the signal as to who Jesus was. Who's the one that they were going to um, arrest. So in the midst of this betrayal, and then towards on the latter part of that chapter, in the midst of the denial of Peter. And he said, Look, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go, and I'm going to die for you. And Jesus says, Yeah, really? You're going to die for me? In fact, I'm going to tell you, you're going to deny me. So, in the midst of this denial and betrayal, Jesus offers this particular verse that we're very familiar with, verses. 34 to 35 of John chapter 13. A new command I give you. Love one another. Now if you remember last time we were talking about how the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest among them. Right? You remember that? Last time we were talking about they were arguing and then no one was willing to maybe just to maybe this is a conjecture but in a place where they didn't have servants there was a basin of water, there was a towel, but no one was going to wash their feet. And Jesus was the one who put the basin and washed their feet. In the midst of all that arguing, and it's supposed to be Passover, it's supposed to be a commemoration of Israel being taken out of Egypt through the Red Sea. He says this, a new command I give to you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now just, just imagine that. If we were here, and, and someone was betraying someone else, and someone was denying being, you know, being a power, and in the midst of all our weaknesses, Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. Love one another. Now it's easy to quote this verse, but in the midst of what was happening that night, doesn't it give color to what Jesus was actually saying? You know, someone just is going to betray me, and you, Peter, are going to deny me. But I'm telling you, every one of you, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Ask it, isn't it? Verse 35. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if 
you carry a big bike. Huh? Not just a Bible. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have a badge that says, Your disciple Jesus. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you are a member of this big mega church. The question in this whole story is how could they maintain unity in the midst of betrayal and denial? How could they maintain that unity, that loving one another? Just imagine if someone betrayed you. Is it easy to love that person? What if someone denied that you are her or his parent? If your son or your child denied, ah, that's not my parent. And, he, and just imagine back then, when you were a little younger and your kids were younger, and you went to a football match and he was playing, and he said, is that your dad? No, he's not. <laughs> In the midst of that, is it easy to love each other? How can we maintain unity in the midst of our weaknesses? That's the big question here. Because we can read the stories, they're nice stories, but they also convict us. John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. And this is where we jump. You know, back in John chapter 15, which was the very first uh, chapter that we tackled, the very first passage that we tackled when we started this, when I started this Greatest Love series. John chapter 15 is Papa. It's about bearing fruit, it's about abiding in Christ. But it's all about love, loving one another. And if you read John chapter 13 and 15 and 17, it's all about love. All about love. And John, and we jump to verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. Now, when Jesus started praying, now in, in the three synoptic gospels, we find that Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane, and their report was that Jesus was in agony, and Jesus was saying, Lord, if if, if it be, if it could be that this cup would pass away from me, then let it be but. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. But in, in John, he doesn't even report that story. When Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, his prayer is a prayer for his glorification along with the Father, that the Father's glory in him, and that as the Father glorifies him, he, the Father is also glorified. He prays for his disciples, the twelve disciples, minus one. And then, in the latter part of that chapter, he prays for all believers of all time, those who will believe him through the message that the eleven disciples will deliver. And he says, my prayer is not for them, the disciples alone, I pray also for those who will believe me. My prayer is not for them alone, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Verse 21 that all of them may be one. Notice this, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you, may they also be, they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, so the Father gave him glory, and now he, he has given that glory to his disciples, so that, for what reason? That they may be one as we are one. I in them, verse 23, I in them, and you in me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Now this is a fantastic study on the glory of God being passed down to the Father, the Son, and the Church. We're not going there. We're talking about something related to this. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. These verses talk about the glory of God. These verses also talk about being one. 
And the whole context from John chapter 13 on to John 17 is about love. And it's about the love of the Father for Jesus, and the love of Jesus for the Father, and the love of Jesus for the church, and the love that is in the church, so we can love Him also, and so that we can love each other. I, I, I made a little, little video here, no copies here, no sounds, but it's a video about the terms that Jesus uses in this particular and I hope this helps us to understand all the things that he's mentioning throughout this passage and help us to understand how this is flowing like a divine dance. It's all about him and his relationship with the Father, and it's all about him flowing in us and helping us to love him and the Father and helping us to love each other. So this is a little video, and it's filled with words. Watch the words. Go ahead and His prayer is that the world will believe, that the world will know that you have sent me, that the Father has sent Jesus. And all that is in the context of the unity, the love that we share with each other, the eternal love that the Father has for Jesus and Jesus has for the Father, and that Jesus has for us, and that Jesus is doing at that time so that he could lay down his life for us. Remember in John 15, verse 13. That he would lay down his life for his friends. And we are his friends. And then he, 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 all through this you see embedded where he's saying, love one another as I have loved you. It's more than love. That the world will believe and know that Jesus is the one who was sent by the Father, by God. If we are in fact in that, in that condition, in that mode where we have that love for God and love for each other and that love of Jesus is flowing through us and flowing among us and that the love of the Father through Jesus in us is flowing out. It's through that that the world knows that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is the Messiah. The problem is, we've come up with all kinds of ways to try to prove to the rest of the world that Jesus is the Messiah. We, if we go back to the Middle Ages, you know, we want the Catholic Church wanted to make sure that everyone um, was in line with the church, and so they had the Inquisition. So if you believed otherwise, you know, you go to the stake or you recant. And then uh, the Protestants, when they came, they, they had their own counter reformation. And if you study how the Spanish Empire spread throughout the world, we were a subject of Spain, the Philippines was. And when they came, they gave us two choices. The cross, which was the sword upside down, or the sword. Either the cross or the sword. And because the natives didn't have the same technology that the Spanish had, they had cannons and and, and you know, and, and guns and, and rifles, and they, they had uh, superior swords. They had no choice but to say, yeah, we'll just get that place, rather than have our heads cut off, right? There are so many ways that we've come up to try to convert the rest of the world. 
Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way Jesus wanted us to do it. His desire for us is to love our fellow humans. His desire for us is to love our enemies. His desire for us is to love those who hate us. So I'm sorry, but I can't go along with all the other Christians who say, you know, we should bomb the ISIS into hell. I think we should love them. I think we should love them into hell. We should just love them, period. Sorry for 9 11, which is a couple of days ago. And we were in the Philippines when 9 11 happened. We were watching TV and suddenly there was breaking news live from America, from, from New York. And we saw this building uh, in smoke. And they were reporting that a, a, um, um, a commercial airline, commercial airplane just Hit that building that fire. And we were watching all that smoke coming up. And then suddenly they were all shouting and screaming, and everyone was saying on, on that uh, broadcast, they were saying, There's another plane that's coming right for the second building. And it hit right there and went up in flames. And we saw it live on TV in the Philippines. We saw the two towers went down. I was like, What happened there? Man, that's. <coughs> And we took up arms. <coughs> what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? I know one thing. He said, love your enemies. I don't know how that translates for you guys. The problem is when they, we say they, we mean everyone then. It's not they, it's a few people. It's a few people. I mean, you got Japanese here. They bomb. Pearl Harbor, but not every Japanese did. Right? The Japanese attacked the Philippines. They, they, they had us for three or four years during the World War. But it wasn't every Japanese. Right? It's not every Japanese. You've got a lot of our enemies. So how do we maintain unity? How do we maintain it? Because as soon as we draw any kind of line, religious line or whatever, we immediately exclude others. See, and this is one thing I like about our website, GCI. One of the one of the pages there are one of the places where we go there. It's called Your Inclusion. See, if we really love Father and Jesus, we need to look at everyone and think, He's not excluded. If I'm included by the grace of God, if I'm included by His love, then I need to include everyone else. Right? We need to include everyone else, regardless of what tradition they have, regardless of where they come from, regardless of whether they're uh, illegal Im immigrants from Mexico or not. I mean, who are we? Even the Israelites were illegal immigrants into Canaan, right? Well, you might say, no, they're not. They're not legal because God told them to go there. But from the Canaanite point of view, they were illegal immigrants. And they killed all the, all the Canaanites, right? So does that give us right to kill all the Indians here in this country? So, 
here's where we are. That's, did we see that slide? We already looked at it? Yeah, that's where we should be. Now let's move on to the next slide. There was one particular um, illustration that I, that, I, that I saw when we had um, a minister's meeting back in the Philippines uh, when we were still worldwide church jobs. And this, this um, illustration stuck to my head. You see, that's Jesus in the middle, that's his feet, and that's a heart right there in the middle. And all of us are just little arrows on the outside trying to make our way in. All of us are little arrows trying to make our way in. Now it doesn't matter whether he's farther from the center from Jesus than I am. That's not the point. We're all going through our journey, our spiritual journey. And we're all hitting snacks, we're all falling down, we're all making mistakes, and we're all thinking this way when we're supposed to be thinking that way. And we're all in the same boat, really. We're all making our journey towards Jesus Christ, right? So why compare with other people? We can't compare. It's false. It's unwise to compare. Instead, we should just look towards the center, look towards Jesus, and say, look, I want to get there. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit is going to help me get there. I have no right to compare myself to others. They are in the history. So I want to conclude with this. This is a passage from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. And Paul wrote this. He said, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That's where we should be on our way out. Keep the unity of the Spirit with one. Not just among us. Among every member of the body of Christ. Every member of the body of Christ. Well, when I went to seminary, they had different ideas than I had. But I just have to take keep of this and maintain that unity. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you believe in the rapture, I don't. Why should I hate you? I have no right to hate you. I should love my enemies, my brothers and sisters, regardless of what they do. So, is there going to be a rapture on the 15th? If you are, let me know. Hey, send me a text, okay? Maybe I missed it. And if we're not, I'm not going to look down on you.